Okay, we're live. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, this is uh, the webinar on uh, writing assessment, and uh, it's hosted by the Journal of Writing Assessment, which is the nation's premier independent journal on writing assessment. Um, journal of Writing Assessment was originally a print and subscription based journal, and in 2011, we moved to a free online open source platform. Um, which is now hosted by the University of Idaho's College, Letters, College of Letters, Arts, and Social Sciences in the Department of English. Um, and the efforts of the, uh, uh, the Journal of Writing Assessment is to focus on national issues connected to college-level writing assessment and the relationship to K-12 settings. And we're working particularly to bridge the chasm between rhetoric and composition in writing studies and educational measurement. Uh, we try to focus on assessment-related issues uh, from a variety of disciplines and perspectives, and our efforts have attracted leading empirical and theoretical researchers from both fields, um, many of whom we have with us this evening. Um, you can find Journal of Writing Assessment online for free at journalofwritingassessment.org. Um, we're committed to providing an independent forum accessible by all that reports on emerging research on writing assessment. Excellent. Thank you, Diane. I'm Carl Whithouse, along with um, Diane Kelly Riley. I'm the co-editor of the Journal of Writing Assessment. And I wanted to talk just for a few moments about two special issues that we have um, coming out. So one of them that we're particularly excited about is a special issue on the impacts of the Common Core State Standard Assessments. And we have that issue coming out, in fact, in about two weeks immediately before the NCTE conference. And we're particularly interested in that. There are five articles that are in that. And the first two really look at issues around the Common Core in terms of systems and writing assessment as a large national system. The second set of two look at the impacts particularly in the post-secondary classroom and the fifth piece thinks about other ways of doing much more contextually rich writing assessments. The second special issue that we have coming really speaks to this panel and this will probably be released in March a little bit before the Four C's conference and that looks at the issue of ethics and writing assessment and in fact when you think about this panel no test is neutral um, writing assessment social justice ethics and um, equity issues that connection between the large um, national mandated exams from the um, well individual state level exams from the Common Core assessments and then this much more contextually rich um, ethically informed mode of assessment that some researchers are thinking about. That's an important dialogue to have and we're really hoping that the panel tonight will carry that dialogue forward. Um, Diane, did you want to say a few more words? Yeah, so we're really particularly interested in extending the conversation in this webinar. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at a variety of questions, uh, some that include what is writing assessment, how might equity be determined, um, why is the role of ethics uh, of practical importance, how is social justice connected to writing um, assessment and we have five questions that we'll pose to our panelists and then we'll dedicate roughly 10 minutes per question um, as they respond and converse with each other. So I'll turn it back over to Carl to introduce the panelists. Sure and I'm gonna go sort of um, across the the bottom of my screen here and introduce folks. So we have Bob Broad from Illinois State University and Bob is the author of a number of articles and two really important books for writing assessment. One called What We Really Value and the other organic writing assessment and he's done a lot to help us think about dynamic criteria mapping and really very valid and localized forms of assessment. We have next to Bob, we have David Slump, who's from the University of Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. And David has been a primary mover in encouraging folks to take an ethical approach to writing assessment. 
We also have Maya Poe from Northeastern University in Boston. And Maya has um, done a, a number of pieces on writing assessment. One of the ones that I think is particularly interesting for the conversation we're going to have tonight is an edited volume that she's put out with um, Asao Inoue called writing As Race and Writing Assessment. And um, I think that's an important volume to think about in the, this conversation. Um, finally, we also have Norbert Elliott, Elliott joining us from um, NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. And um, Norbert has done some of the most important work in on the history of writing assessment. Um, he has a particularly good book called On a Scale, which really traces a lot of the dynamics around um, ETS and their efforts to measure writing. And even for a large-scale organization, some attempts to be very fair about um, writing assessment, but doing that on a large scale and all the tensions that are involved with that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start with my, the first question. And um, that question is one that we've heard here before. And I think, just a second, I think David is going to take the lead on responding to this. But the question is, what are the key issues teachers, students, and stakeholders need to know about problems with current large-scale writing assessment models? Uh, thanks, Carl. I, I, I would start by saying we need to pay attention to um, the, the intentions behind large-scale assessment and to recognize that both historically and I think contemporarily speaking, the intentions behind, behind large-scale writing assessment have been positive ones to ensure equal access to opportunity for students and for, for citizens, um, and, and to look at building strong systems of education. If the intention is good, then we have to ask the question, wh where does the problem come from? And I would argue that the problem we see in contemporary large-scale writing assessment comes from the fact that we've narrowly conceptualized the standards through which we evaluate the quality of the assessment programs we use um, to uh, deliver on these goals. And so primarily I'm talking about concepts of reliability, validity, and, and fairness. And I think we'll talk about all of these as we go through um, the evening. But I just want to focus in on reliability for a, for a moment. So re reliability describes the, the social values of dependability and consistency. We want our tests to be dependable. We want them to consistently measure what we intend for them to be measuring. Um, Jay Parks, in, in a great article titled uh, Reliability is Argument, uh, argues that the problem isn't with the social value. The problem is with the fact that in, in measurement uh, literature, we've kind of operationalized these values through a set of sort of narrow mathematical and statistical kind of procedures and processes. And that these then narrow the scope of assessment and design possibilities available to us. Um, so what we see, for example, in order to meet high standards of reliability as defined uh, through these processes, we see a, a, a move towards timed impromptu writing assessments, for example, as opposed to, let's say, portfolio assessment programs. Um, we see uh, a reliance on computer grading of student writing versus more of a hermeneutic, discussion-based, consensus-building approach to grading student, uh, student writing. So we see a narrowing in terms of the scope of assessment uh, tools available to us. The types of tests that meet these standards of, of reliability often tend to only measure aspects of the writing construct um, that can be easily captured within, within these designs. So we see, for example, an emphasis on metacognition, or on process skills being um, minimized or even ignored in, in many uh, timed impromptu assessment uh, designs. Um, so the problem then from th that stems from this issue is that w when we have poor construct representation in our assessment tools, um, in environments where tests are used to rank schools, to evaluate teachers, or to rank students in terms of appropriating opportunities to them, we see an amplified pressure for teachers to prepare kids for the narrow constructs that the tests are measuring, not for the broader understandings of writing 
that we know are important for them in terms of long-term development. And what we see particularly, I think, um, problematic is that in contexts where test scores are most uh, in need of, of, of rising, often we see inner city schools or schools with marginalized or, or um, uh, at-risk kind of populations, we see this pressure to raise test scores. And often what happens in those contexts is we see an increasingly narrow focus on the narrow constructs the tests are designed to measure. So if you look in the uh, showcase, you'll see a, uh, an example, a thesis from one of my master's students at the University of Ottawa. She won a national award here in Canada for her thesis, Literacy on Lockdown, which describes in detail what happens in an inner city school in, in, in Canada um, that was really heavily focused on making sure test scores rose. And she contrasts the experience she saw there with the experience she had teaching refugees on the Burmese border uh, in terms of the rich practices around literacy they experienced versus the very narrow and limited practices they saw. So I would say we see an issue of construct representation driving a narrowness of instruction that really undermines the overall positive intentions and goals of large-scale assessment. Um, one last note, we note that there's been a focus in the U.S. in the last two weeks about limiting the number and frequency of testing in school and I think that addresses the issue in part, but it actually misses the broader point. Frequency of assessment is not the issue. Um, what's really the issue is that we need to address the quality of assessments. And if current standards of validity, reliability, and fairness aren't equal to the task of designing high quality assessments that deliver on this intention around equity, then we need something else that will do that, which is why I think this panel, we've, we've been working together for the last year and a half to look at what a theories of ethics might be able to say about that issue. There's a lot to comment on there, so I'll just jump in. And <laughs> then maybe uh, Bob or Norbert would also want to jump in too. Um, I, I I just came off a, a, another webinar. We're, we're talking with K-12 teachers about some of these issues, and I, I disagree with you, David. The number of tests is too much and it, it, it deteriorates the data when students are tested too much. Um, there's lots of little finish lines given to students. So yeah, construct representation alignment of standards to test is important, but also you know, thinking about the effects of tests on students is super, super important. And it's super important in terms of their literacy or writing development. The other thing I was going to jump in here and say is I, I think the intent necessarily of, of initial test design was always um, meritocratic. It wasn't about redistribution of social resources. This is about ranking and measuring, which was about further re re reifying existing um, social hierarchy. So to rethink about assessment as something that can disrupt social hierarchies is really a pretty radical thing to do with assessment. Great. Thanks, Maya. Does anybody else want to weigh in um, on this first question before we move on to the next one? I would just very briefly um, note, following on Maya's comment, that um, the last few sentences she spoke made me think about John Rawls' The Theory of Justice, which I think a number of us have been paying attention to in our writings about ethics and writing assessment. And uh, this somewhat radical or visionary notion that Rawls has, that in order for something to be just, it has to be a thing that uh, provides opportunities for those who have been deprived of those opportunities in the past. And um, I'm excited by the ways in which the work of the people uh, working on this special issue and talking on this panel is moving in that direction. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Well, I'll, I'll uh, present the next question. Um, what key ideas and practices should guide the field of writing assessment? How could explicitly addressing ethical issues, such as fairness, shift major assumptions within the field of writing assessment? And how might those considerations affect the daily lives of teachers? Because we do have a lot of teachers who are joining in with us this evening, and maybe later on watching this at their own time. Yeah, I think I was supposed to start off on this one, so I'll just 
go. <laughs> uh, the first one I would think is one of the things that needs to guide the field of writing assessment is teacher input. You know, we are a field that was spawned largely out of teacher resistance to external forces, and I think we need to not forget that. Um, the, the thing I would most hate to happen to our field is that we become so specialized that we don't have any input or kind of uh, we don't recognize teacher expertise in any kind of way that within the construction of research in our field. Um, the other thing I think that was really important about writing assessment is it needs to be more than just best practices. It needs to have a research agenda to it that's tied to research on writing development. You know, in the field, we know a lot about how students develop as writers, and that needs to inform what we do when we assess students. Otherwise. I think assessment is just pretty meaningless. We could potentially even be doing harm if we're working at cross purposes with how students develop as writers. Uh, next point I would say about this is, is I think one of our purposes or our guiding principles for writing assessment should be that yes, we can learn from measurement theory. There's lots of wonderful things in measurement theory, but we don't need to be slavishly indebted to it. Um, we can actually innovate it and do things for ourselves for it that might be interesting. In one of those areas, I think we can do something really interesting in regards to issues around fairness. And that's because fairness hasn't been particularly well theorized by the measurement field. And so I think there's lots of room or opportunity there to do something with fairness. So let me talk about just kind of two quick points about fairness, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues. One is that I think that writing studies or composition and rhetoric has a long tradition of a uh, commitment to social justice issues. So I'd like to see fairness tied to that uh, disciplinary uh, belief that we have that social justice needs to be involved in the teaching of writing. And the second thing is, is I think that we don't necessarily need to look within our field, but I think issues of fairness can also, for example, look to the Civil Rights Act or other kinds of disciplines outside our field. For ultimately, composition and rhetoric is an interdisciplinary field or a multidisciplinary field. And we have long taken things from other fields and made them our own for our own purposes. Great. Uh, other panelists, would you like to join in on the question about what kind of key ideas and practices should guide the field of writing assessment? I can jump in uh, for a moment here. I want to touch on Maya's first point about, I think, how um, this this field really uh, needs to rely on teacher expertise and, and be connected to, to practices in schools. Um, it's one of the reasons why here at the U of L we built a master's program in curriculum and, and classroom assessment. I think it's the only one in the country of its kind that has an intensive focus on building teacher um, classroom assessment capacity. Um, here in Alberta, we often hear the argument that we need more standardized testing because we can't trust teacher classroom assessment practices. And we actually uh, think that that's the wrong, that's the wrong response. I, I think historically, and the research shows us this, faculties of education have done a poor job of preparing teachers for the work of doing assessment in classrooms. Um, but that doesn't mean we give it over then. What it means is we need to build programs and we need to really make sure that we, we work hard with teachers to help build that capacity. Uh, that. So that's one of the responses that, that, that we've done is looking at how do you build high quality rigorous assessments in the classroom that you can use to make important decisions about students' lives and their futures and about the system uh, as a whole. Uh, I think that's an important uh, piece that our, I think our field uh, has a lot to offer uh, more broadly speaking. David, can I follow up on that for just a second? Because one of the issues here I think that was asked about was professional development teachers. And that makes a lot of sense. But when you start getting into issues of localized scoring, one of the issues that becomes really tough is often issues of inter rater reliability. And I know a lot of folks that are interested in psychometrics are interested in inter rater reliability, not just as sort of a numeric claim, but really as a way of getting at issues of fairness so that a student's essay that's written in rural Florida is great at the same way if you're looking at a large, you know, statewide exam as an st urban student from Miami. Um, is there any sort of connection between professional development, teacher training, and training and assessment that might address those connections between reliability and fairness? 
You know, I think I think Bob's work is really, uh, to me, where I go to to answer that question. And looking at processes like dynamic criteria mapping, Bob came up here to Alberta where we uh, we ran uh, one session with him and then another three session, another two sessions after that. 180 high school language arts teachers, university writing instructors, where we collectively talked about what are the aspects of writing that we value. And how do we measure that? And how do we how do we identify that in in samples of student writing? And so so I've seen that happen here on a large scale, uh, with Bob uh, helping us facilitate that in the work that I do right now with teachers in the field. That's part of the process we work through. Uh, so I'm on a project right now with uh, with eight schools, and uh, we're working on locally developing some assessments here uh, that really focus on metacognitive skill development as writers in kids. And part of the process is we've, we've got three tasks that we've designed for the kids to work through. And part of that process is we come together after each task has been completed. We bring in samples of the student work. We bring in graffiti walls and process things that the kids have generated. And we, we spend a day going through that material together, looking at what is it telling us about metacognitive development in these students? What does it tell us about... Um, about how they're able to execute on that metacognitive uh, awareness. Um, and so we come to sort of collective understandings. And it's interesting because I'm doing this work with teachers who are from grade 6 all the way up to grade 12, and yet we can have that conversation across those six grade levels uh, when we kind of look at these things. So I would say that that's, that's where I would, would work with more of the kind of work that Bob uh, points us to being done with teachers um, in schools. What we see right now in Alberta, I just did a study with grade 9 teachers here in southern Alberta, and I would say almost 100% of the writing assessments that I analyzed as part of that study were scored using the uh, achievement test, the provincial uh, marking guides. You know, so teachers kind of have given it over in those contexts, and I think we need to work to help them just to define their own sets of values and, and expectations, and then work to communicate those. Excellent. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I? I was going to say if maybe I can Bob, uh, ask Bob a question here, and this might be an unfair one. Either pick up on some of what David said, or in fact give us the the two minute version of dynamic criteria mapping. <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, actually, uh, don't let me don't let me fail to answer that question. But I want to just throw in a thing that I was going to say in response to what David just said. Um, I. Uh, celebrate and support his um, commitment and I think he exemplifies it as well as anyone whose work I've followed to working with teachers and developing professionalism and ethics and high quality teaching uh, at the grassroots level and I just want to say that I feel that that solution um, is the solution I feel that for decades in US society at least there's been a movement a powerful movement to take authority and credibility and resources away from teachers and public schools and invest them in other places, for example, testing corporations or charter schools. And I, I, I firmly believe, separate from, as separate as I can get it from, you know, say my political beliefs, I believe that that, that will never work. That only when we invest the credibility, the authority, and the resources in the public schools are we going to get the kinds of results in terms of educational quality and also um, scores on assessments that we're striving for. Okay, so Carl asked for the uh, comic book one-minute version of dynamic criteria mapping. And luckily, that's not hard to do. <laughs> um, dynamic criteria mapping calls for teachers to get together and read samples of their own students' writing and talk about what they like and what they don't like in those samples of students' writing and someone needs to make careful notes and create a record of what they say they value and don't value and then in the spirit of qualitative inquiry or grounded theory you go in and you analyze those data and what you're able to come up with is a fairly rich representation of at least some of those teachers values around writing and then that documentation um, which sometimes is called a dyna dynamic criteria map but you can call it anything you want to. You can call it a rubric. That's that's not a problem. Uh, that gets published and shared with students and other teachers and parents and legislators and everyone who cares about education and the teaching of writing gets to learn not what is the simple and quick and sanitized version of, of what people value in writing, which is what you typically get from a traditional rubric, 
but a rich and contextualized and powerful and complicated and controversial portrait of values, which is the way the world actually works. Great. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Um, so, actually, our, our next question um, is, is directly for Bob here. So, how might a consideration of ethics change how we design classroom and our large-scale writing assessments? Well, in the work I've done uh, contributing to the special issue that this group has worked on together, um, what I pursued was uh, how a couple of testing corporations have attempted to articulate and follow through on ethical and guidelines and guidelines of fairness. And um, there's one corporation who, for the moment, will remain unnamed, who I believe uh, does not even really make a serious attempt at laying out gui ethical guidelines. But I'd like to focus for a moment on the Educational Testing Service, which I believe really does do a sincere uh, effort. And they have a very well-developed set of guidelines. But in my analysis, what I discovered is despite their intentions, and now I'm really just echoing what David said earlier about the difference between intentions and consequences. What I discovered is despite their intentions and you know explicitly articulated commitments toward fairness and equality and things like this, um, by the end of that document, which is roughly 50 pages long, we've uh, the things that most teachers and citizens and students would recognize as fairness and equality fade into the background and the things that are foregrounded are instead more of the technical, statistical, psychometric um, mechanisms that, as David pointed out, have traditionally been intended to uh, preserve fairness but sometimes don't have that result. So what I found was even an intention and a striving toward fairness uh, in the context of standardized testing ends up leading us toward assessments that in a variety of ways are not fair to teachers and students. The, the bottom line is I think there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that in a, an environment of many high-stakes standardized tests, educational quality is diminished. That, that I know is a controversial statement, but I think there's loads of evidence to support it. And just one book that I'll mention is The Testing Trap by George Hillux, published in 2002. But decades before that and in the decades since, there's more and more evidence of that. So how would a concern for ethics framed that way lead us toward new designs? I'm not sure how new the designs are, but my go-to assessment design would be the writing portfolio, a diverse and richly contextualized set of rhetorical performances where students write in different rhetorical situations or different genres, depending on how you prefer to, to describe it, and the student uh, you know, can show that she can write a poem, she can write a, a political speech, she can write a business proposal, she can write a memo, uh, and there's dozens and dozens of, of types of writing a student might choose to do. And the point is those are real world, real life writing assignments uh, collected together, revised, the student receives response, the student uh, has the opportunity to revise over time. It's not a timed writing that's done in 30 minutes or 40 minutes or 60 minutes. And uh, it's more like what writing teachers know most writing in the world is like. And therefore, that turns out to be not only a more valid assessment, but assessment that results in higher educational quality. And for me, the bottom line is that that's ethical. Let me jump in here and say one thing. I think a shift to ethics means that we shift the focus in designing assessments from thinking about measuring something to whom we're measuring. <laughs> and we think about students, the people who are going to be responding to writing and assessments. We think about being accountable to them and to the communities from which they come from. We think about what it is we're ultimately doing now and downstream. So we think about time, long strength of time. And in regard to ethics, I think that it, it really kind of opens up some possibilities for us. So for Carl, we're not hampered by kind of, oh, do we have great iterator reliability? Well, let's think about consequences downstream then. Said. Let's think about adverse impact instead. There gives us a kind of new language, kind of new ways, again, of thinking about writing assessment. And one other thing I would say about ethics is I think that ethics may not be something that's about feel good and about simple compliance of people doing well. We can think about ethics also being kind of a 
a strong hand to, for example, make testing companies act in more ethical ways. And that's one of my interests in thinking about legal moves that can be made, whether it be through consumer fraud kinds of lawsuits, product liability kinds of lawsuits, where there's a misalignment between standards and tests, or uh, misscoring, as has happened in the past in various tests, or in terms of disparate impact claims that can be brought to the office of the rights of the Department of Education. I think Maya's, um, yeah, I think bang on uh, on there. Um, when I work with, just putting this into the context of classroom teachers, when I work with classroom teachers on this, one of the first questions I ask them when we begin design work is, is who are you designing this for? And what inferences and uses do you want to make of the data that you're going to generate through this, through this instrument, uh, through this, this, this assessment program? And this is often a question that, that sort of makes them step back and go, because often classroom teachers don't necessarily think about assessment design in terms of inferences and uses um, of data. It's we need to do this, we need to generate a score, but when we start talking about you need to stream kids into upper academic or college stream or workplace stream, what body of evidence have you created, have you generated that's going to be able to enable you to justify that decision. And if you meet with parents to say, we're going to stream your son into this level or to that level, can you, can you look them in the eye and say, I have a solid body of evidence that I can use to justify that decision? I think, um, I think that, that focus on ethics, when we look at who are we doing this for, who are we accountable to in terms of assessment work, does change some of the dynamics that we have to be paying attention to. Great, thank you, David. Um, I wanted to let you all know that we have received a question from the outside, from an outside viewer, and I thought I would uh, pose this to Norbert Elliott to bring him into the conversation. Um, and if you would answer the question, do the panelists see writing assessment as a K to college field that includes educational researchers as well as um, college writing assessment composition of specialists? So it seems that sometimes um, composition and rhetoric or writing studies are not always connected to the work in education. And maybe, Norbert, you can start us off on talking about that a bit. Uh, it's a great question, and it's absolutely correct. And we have these disjunctures among disciplinary fields where we very often end up in silos. So the person who knows to use a quadratic weighted kappa is not the same person who's able to talk about rhetoric and discourse forms, is not the same person who's able to say, what the impact of this is going to be on the individual teacher. I, I wish that our, our colleague Ellen Cushman would have been able to join us this afternoon. She's been so good in helping us all to think about the score use, the impact that something has on very, very diverse communities. As Maya's demonstrated in her work, the, the, the demographic shifts that are happening now in the country and that are going to happen simply will not allow the same old tired solutions that had all along, the, the value dualisms that exist between local scoring and large-scale testing, that exist between the rhetoric and composition community and the, the educational research and education community. So I think that this is a, a, good, a good hallmark in, uh, in our history to be able to say no, no further uh, should we go down the routes that we've been going down in the past for the sake of our students, for the sake of our own futures. It, it's simply unwise. Uh, to isolate each other and to isolate our students and much more wise to participate in these multidisciplinary activities. So, a really great question from, from our audience. It's an interesting to see in the scholarship how in composition and rhetoric work on writing and assessment we've begun to cite work in measurement. We've been doing it for a while but it's really has started to pick up. Unfortunately the measurement community has not been as readily active in, in citing our work, which has been unfortunate, and that's been documented in scholarship. But also the one area I would, I would amplify here or add to it is that we haven't been very good with engaging with language testing, and our field has had a keen interest in uh, talking about multilingual students and the translingual move, and yet language assessment seems nowhere to be within the kind of uh, discussions we're having about writing assessment.
Well, Maya, that question really kind of ties nicely into the next, uh, the, four, the fourth of our five questions. Um, and maybe it would be good to start off with your perspective on this, um, and then we can open it up to the rest of our panelists. But, but how would a consideration of ethics enable us to better attend to the needs of the diversity of students in our classroom? Sure. And so my answer here, I'm channeling Ellen Cushman because she typed in some notes on our Google Docs. So I'm, I'm kind of looking at those as I'm also answering. So I, I'm, I'm operating with two brains here, one far superior to my own. So she'll carry the day, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, so the first thing is, is that I, I, this is me talking. First of all, we actually have to count diverse students. It's just stunning to me in college writing assessment how often we don't disaggregate our data. I'm like, what in the world are we doing? We do this number of students in basic writing. This is not like, well, who? And then we go to a class and go, oh my goodness, this is full of multilingual students and, and students of color. And I'm like, well, if you need to actually disaggregate it at the beginning, look at them doing it. Done something simply that's better at disaggregating our data. And that goes at one of the assumptions that has been a hallmark of our field, in that, for example, we do placement testing or exit testing, that we should blind um, portfolios, we should blind those kinds of top exams. And yes, for scoring purposes, I can see blinding them, but they should be unblinded in regards to decision making processes and understanding and interpreting the data. Secondly, is I think we need to design ways to surface issues of fairness, this is Ellen here, especially those might perpetuate social hierarchies and inequalities. And those can come about in a couple ways. To think about different ways that students can access assessment. Students who have either neural diversity or cultural diversity, we need to think about these things, about different ways that they can come to writing assessment. And for example, let me take a very specific example here. A lot of e-portfolio um, programs are actually not ADA compliant. And so that's not a conversation we've had in our field. Secondly, I don't think we've done a very good job at all of explaining to students, you know, clarifying appeals or potential opt-out um, opportunities for them, their right to opt out of particular kinds of placement processes, which I think should be part of the, our discussion in our field because of the diverse belief systems that our students bring with them. And I think we also need regards to understanding diversity, understanding the implications for adverse impact. And also, I also mentioned ties to language testing. Ellen thought also we need to think with a variety of assessments where we need to better help teachers demonstrate learning in their classroom and how that teaching fosters a community of learners. The last thing that we want to foster in our field is the notion of Oh, a white people's burden because we now have so many diverse students. That's completely wrong. Um, diverse students bring us so many opportunities. They make us better teachers and to help think about how we can think about becoming better teachers through the assessment of diverse students, both racial diversity, linguistic diversity, neural diversity, socioeconomic diversity, and so on. And I'll stop there and let others weigh in. I will very briefly um, throw in, and this might be a lead-in for Norbert to comment further, um, but in his uh, contribution to the special issue, I think he does a fantastic job of really laying out, and, and, and this is in harmony with Maya's work too, that really when it comes down to it, attention to diversity and the legitimizing and the transvaluing of, of diversity into a resource and a positive uh, a set of positive resources is really the definition of fairness moving forward in our society. Um, th there's really no other functional way to go at notions of fairness and ethics other than to focus on uh, the diversity of our cultures and the ways in which we can find uh, true and positive value in multiple ways of succeeding, whether it's in the rhetorical arts, writing studies, or in other areas. And Norbert, would you like to comment a little bit further on um, how the consideration of ethics uh, better enables us to attend to the needs of our diverse students? Sure. It's, uh, going last on this panel is, is, is difficult. It's, it's a, a, a photoshopped uh, image of Elizabeth Warren and Hillary Clinton sitting beside one another in a little bubble coming out of Hillary Clinton's mouth is what she said. 
and that's 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 very much what's going on here. You know, I agree with everything that everybody's said here, and there's 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 very little room for for nuance, but I think room for a little more explication. Um, I, I think we have, we have to imagine that that um, that fairness should be understood as opportunity to learn. And unless we're conducting these assessments for opportunity to learn for the sake of our students, then there's really some questions about why we're conducting them in the first place. Um, and if, if we sort of think about advancing opportunity structures, and here we, we think about classic work of people like Robert K. Merton, we begin to link fairness to exactly that, to, to systems by which we might op advance opportunity structures for students. Um, as part of this, I, I, everyone's alluded to the writing construct. Uh, very narrowly and very slenderly conceived, I think, in most cases. Um, I, I think we can easily imagine, and we've put a, an image in, our, in our, our, our little forum that folks can refer to later, of a four domain model. One is cognitive, genre knowledge, task knowledge, those things we know. But every classroom teacher knows that interpersonal domain knowledge is very important, the idea of working in communities and collaborating, as well as intrapersonal, you know, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, the ability of students and the willingness to revise. And I think Maya very well pointed out that, that we have to understand that, that our obligation is not a burden, that we should think of neurological as the, as the other domain, as the fourth domain, so that we're, we're not narrowly conceiving writing is simply cognitive, interpersonal, intrapersonal, but that we're learning from those who are abled in different ways and, and perhaps expanding those domains a little more. Um, so I, I think that, that if we think about advancement of opportunity structure for fairness and we think about broadening the domain construct, then we begin to think about networks of stakeholders and what networks of stakeholders stand to gain from these things. Um, primarily, we must be doing this for our students, but we should also be thinking about our, our, our parents, our, our teachers, our administrators, our workplace uh, colleagues who are trying to figure out ways that the schools might better enable transitions for those who are not going to go into post-secondary education, but for those who are going to go into the workplace immediately following K-12 education. And I, th I think that that brings to something everybody in the panel talked about, and I'll conclude with this. The firm establishment in all of this of the role of teachers. It is a great disappointment to many of us that the standards in educational and psychological testing, even in its most recent edition, does not establish a role for teachers here. How on earth are any of these things going to make meaning? How are they going to have effectiveness in advancing opportunity to learn structures unless we integrate the role of the teacher into this process? So uh, I, I think that in our, our multidisciplinary considerations that are coming forward and thinking about a broader domain construct, that firmly at the center of this, what we must establish and recognize and, and use uh, the role of teacher knowledge in, in any of these kind of assessments, whether they are large scale or, or whether they're local. Excellent. Thank you, Norbert. Um, so I'm curious, I mean, you're speaking about um, teacher knowledge and the importance of teacher knowledge here. And certainly in the special issue on the, the Common Core State Standard Assessments, there's at least two articles that speak to the importance of, of teacher knowledge making an intervention in some of these large-scale assessments and in some ways critiquing those large-scale assessments, perhaps not through a lens of ethics, but at least based on the implications and the results of these large-scale tests. One of the articles is Todd Rucker et al.'s piece on the implications for um, English language learners. And thinking about that gets me to another question that we had come in um, sort of over the wire, which is a question about, given the research about the detrimental consequences of high-stakes tests, um, why do we keep doing it? Why aren't we, and whether this is as a society or as a group of writing assessment researchers or the folks that are designing large-scale tests, why, do we, why don't we use 
evidence about these detrimental consequences to rethink public policy. And in some ways the question that we have is what is, a, what is it about using ethics that really allows for a reframing of the dynamics and public policy going forward? How does ethics change the, the discourse and the direction of this? And I'm thinking, um, David, you probably have a few comments or thoughts about this. Yeah, I want to go back to the, what, I, what I talked about at the very beginning here about uh, concepts of validity, reliability, and fairness. Talk about reliability already. We've talked about fairness. We haven't talked as much about validity. But here's, I, I think here's part of the problem. If you look at validity as a, as a way of evaluating the quality of an assessment, um, validity has been conceptualized narrowly to focus on test score use and interpretation. Uh, even Kane's more recent uh, model for validation uh, where he looks at unintended and intended consequences, it, it pushes, I think, the frames further but he's very careful to kind of keep that focus on score use and interpretation. And I think when that's what we're focused on, it, it's, it's easy to sort of, um, I think, ignore in many respects the research that shows detrimental effects. But what ethics does is it compels us to focus on consequences for systems of education broadly, but also for populations of people uh, for students, for teachers, it, it, it sort of compels us to look at these issues through the narratives of their effects on real people in their lives. Um, and, that. and I think that that shift is an important one. I remember at a conference years ago um, talking to a, a measurement uh, specialist here who, who basically kind of dismissed a lot of the concerns from the writing assessment community uh, or the, the composition uh, community saying, you know, the, your, your constructs are constantly shifting. We can't possibly build large-scale assessments to meet sort of the whimsical nature of sort of, you know, your field and how it's understanding this um, and that. In a sense, it was sort of a dismissal of um, the broader concerns about, about people. And if you say, hold on, this is not just an academic discussion about your construct is better than my construct. But it's about if we miss the constructs, if we don't capture them well, they have detrimental effects for kids, um, for students, for systems of education, for teachers. Um, I think framing it through ethics enables us to bring that focus uh, to this work. And I think it makes it harder um, to, to ignore the issues. Mm -hmm. So that would be my, uh, my primary response to that. Excellent. Thanks, David. Um, Bob, do you want to do you want to uh, say a few things and then go over to Maya? Sorry. Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, I'll try to be brief. I just want to say to the person who posed the question that um, my entry into my work uh, as part of this group um, exactly emerged from precisely the same question. If there's plenty of evidence of detrimental effects on the quality of education, especially in writing, of these um, commercial tests, these standardized tests. Why do we just keep giving more and more of those tests? And the way I went at answering that question was, first I tapped into Upton Sinclair's famous quotation, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his paycheck depends on his not understanding it. And so that was a way of saying it's, it's really uh, intellectually impossible not because of any weakness or shortcoming on the part of people who work for these corporations, but because of how they earn their money. It's, it's impossible for them to see clearly the kinds of concerns that teachers are running up against every day in their classrooms. And so that I tried to pursue it as an ethical question, an ethical issue. You know, what are the ethical shortcomings of standardized testing, testing and what are the alternatives that would be more ethical? And I think just looking at it through the lens of ethics brings a kind of urgency and clarity that's very uncomfortable for a lot of people in this conversation, but I think ultimately is going to be helpful to our profession and to our society. So I just want to pick up one thing on the question about all the, the detrimental effects of post testing. Certainly we've seen the effects, the washback effects on teaching, the narrowing of the curriculum, the amount of sheer amount of time that's now taking in schools for testing, the whole secondary um, commercial enterprise of tutoring and all this kind of apparatus to help standardized testing happen in schools and also just the amount of money that's filtered away from actual education to, to testing. 
Um, so what I think by shifting the, 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 the other two things I would say there is that the effects that the middle class also tend to be psychological well-being of students. And also certainly to learning. In my own work, I've been interested in thinking about writing assessment, a high stakes testing effects on writing and development. And if they really do, the effects really do transfer what students, uh, how students learn, to, how students learn as writers. What's interesting in the scholarship is that students, do, they don't want bad assessment, they want good assessment. They do want feedback because they see that it is integral to developing as writers. What fairness does, what ethics does, is it pays attention to these different sort of things. And Norbert's position, I'm going to turn it over to him next, is that fairness comes first before validity and reliability. It is, if we can't be accountable to students, then why are we testing at all? Great, and so we'll maybe move to the last question that we have for this evening. Um, and we'll begin with uh, Norbert's response to it, which is uh, how might a theory of ethics really enable us to better advocate for and inform the changes in the design of large-scale writing assessments and you know the, the impacts that they would have on the children who have to take them? We've answered so much of this already in, in the round table. Um, so let's see if we can break just a little new ground around, around this question. Um, there are deep and profound structural inequalities in our culture, and testing is a representative of those. It's, it's an artifact of those inequalities that are structured in. I, I think our, our job has to be something different. I, I think our, our job has to be to reveal these and to begin to see the need for locally based assessment. Um, there, there are or Large-scale assessment breaks down when scores become disaggregated. So it looks very good for a general population. Uh, it does not look so good when you begin to look at the scores and how those scores turn out for various subgroups. So an inter-reader reliability may look wonderful for an overall population and would all celebrate the standard gauge of 0.7 being used. But in a more complex writing assessment, these things are just not true at all. Uh, the 0.7 standard gauge breaks down immediately. Instead of seeing that as a bad thing, Bob Broad has often reminded us of this, it's a good thing to investigate why these reliability coefficients do not line up as expected. So simply taking any one of the a number of perspectives helps us examine the situation more fully. I think everybody on the panel, as Maya was, was, was so kind to allude to, was believes in a principle of fairness first. We have these, again, we use the word silos of validity and reliability, and fairness is tacked on at the end. Let us look at consequence first. Before we look at anything, let's ask the question, well, how we're going to use the scores? What inferences, based on our previous research and knowledge, may be allowed for score inference? If we take that as the first principle, then we begin to see that there's a possibility of an integrated and a unified framework for assessment that focuses, first of all, on score use. And if, if we can't figure out a way to learn, to advance opportunities to learn for our students and for ourselves, then let us simply not do these and, and let's rely on those who know the students best, the teachers evaluations and inferences that teachers make because they're the only ones capable of understanding a four domain model because they're the only ones who have watched their students grow over a longitudinal period of time. Even the most robust assessments, portfolio assessments, are going to take place in one occasion on one time. Um, folks are going to gather into a room and they're going to evaluate them in a certain way. So they're wonderful, but nothing is as good as teacher knowledge. So to re- institute the importance of teacher knowledge seems to be a very good outcome of a fairness first principle. So I have a, a question about the size of, of the local because as we've been talking on this panel we've been talking about large-scale assessment and clearly Diane and I are thinking very heavily right now about the common core state standards and in some ways these are you know done on state levels but really they're primarily through Park and Smarter Balance, the consortiums, in some ways almost national level um, versions of assessment 
And yet on the panel I've been constantly reminded about the importance of teacher knowledge, the importance of localized scoring, and that makes me think not even so much about the importance of a localized assessment in terms of a state level assessment, but really localized assessment almost by individual classroom. And so I'm wondering as, as we start to think about, well, what would it look like to have, and I'm going to steal a title from one of the articles in the special issue on the Common Core, not the ethics, but um, it's a piece by Sherry Rankins Robertson um, and a few other folks, but it's called Moving Beyond the Common Core to Develop Rhetorically Based and Contextually Set Assessed sorry, contextually sensitive assessment practices. I wonder, without having seen the article, if you had to think about well, what scale, what size should a localized assessment be? Where would you draw the lines? Is it an individual classroom? Is it a teacher with a seminar of 15 students? Could you do a localized assessment for a whole college? Where, where do you get into a localized assessment? I, I guess I'm directing this question to Barbara. Yeah. I think that our stage can handle on this, I think, out of those of us in the panel. Uh, you know, it's, it's a great question. I mean, it's really the project that I'm working on right now. And I'm starting with uh, with eight, uh, eight teachers in seven schools in um, primarily one school district here in southern Alberta. And this project that I started with began with these teachers a year ago where we took a deep and rich look at what is writing, what is the construct of writing ability. As we understood that construct and its nuances um, more completely, I had them self-assess their own classroom assessment practices to see where the strengths and weaknesses in those practices were in terms of capturing that construct. What they discovered was that they were over scaffolding for their students, which was a really interesting thing for them to realize. So when they give kids a new writing assignment, often what they would do is they would give them the templates that go with that writing assignment, and they would give them a process guide for that. And what they were doing through that practice was they were um, limiting kids' um, capacity to actually have to try to figure this stuff out for themselves, so that when they get a new writing task that no one's ever taught them before outside of a classroom, they're actually not learning the skills they need to be able to figure this stuff out for themselves. So we started from there. The project went from there to then collectively designing a series of assessment um, assessments that we could use that would help to both measure that metacognitive dimension of writing ability, and that would also help kids foster those skills. Um, so we worked, uh, we worked there. My goal over the long term is then to build this out, work with these teachers to work within their schools, and then work within those schools to work at the district level. So I guess that's my, I would say I starting with, with teachers in, in their individual classrooms and build outwards to a district level and then who knows where that goes if it goes to the level of the province at some point. Great, thank you David. Um, so I think Diane and I want to start moving towards um, wrapping up this conversation right now. Um, I want to begin by by thanking our panelists. I really think this was a fascinating and engaged conversation around writing assessment and around both issues of the Common Core and um, Right, and, and ethics for writing assessment. And there's clearly work that we have to do that's both to study the impact of the current assessment regi regime nationally in the U.S., but also work that we need to do around issues of ethics and fairness. Um, Diane, do you want to say a few words about how these conversations are going to go forward, hopefully in the Journal of Writing Assessment, but then also some visions that we have for NCTE and for C's? Yes, and so um, as an online open access independent journal, um, the Journal of Writing Assessment is responsive to this quickly changing assessment landscape. And since um, we're um, online, we're not sort of burdened by the necessity to have uh, things in print and go through kind of a lengthy print process. So we're always uh, looking forward to supporting these kinds of conversations. Um, and uh, we particularly want to invite those of you who are joining us for this presentation uh, as 
uh, to invite you to participate in those uh, contributions. So we have an open call for the Journal of Writing Assessment um, that we review scholarship that investigates issues covered in our webinar today. Uh, and we particularly want to see scholarship that includes teacher perspective, uh, student perspective, um, the impact. So um, answering a lot of the questions that were raised, we would be very interested in. Um, we also host the JWA Reading List, which is available at jwareadinglist.blogspot.com, um, in which we review publications that are emerging related to writing assessment. And we try to give each other a heads up about how these um, pieces relate to our work. And so if you have a recent publication that you've read related to writing assessment that would be of interest to our readership, um, visit our site for more information on ways that you might help orient others um, in this scholarship. Um, we also want to participate and have conversations at conferences that um, continue to bring people together um, uh, around uh, discussion about issues of um, these assessment issues and ways that we can make them more ethical, more inclusive for teachers and particularly students. Um, and we're really appreciative of both NCTE and um, 4Cs for sponsoring these conversations like this webinar. Um, and we hope to enjoy, uh, have more conversations like this. This has been uh, a great uh, forum. Um, and so we really appreciate um, their support of this evening's panel, No Test is Neutral, Writing Assessments, Equity, Ethics, and Social Justice. And both Carl Whithouse and myself, Diane Kelly Riley, thank you all for your participation.